thank you for your interest in watching or listening to this sermon preached at North Point Baptist Church. Our hope is that our preaching ministry serves you well. We do, however, wish to strongly discourage you from using this or any other of our sermons as your primary means of spiritual nourishment. We urge that you would seek this spiritual nourishment in the context of a local church under the care of pastors and members who know and love you. May our contribution to your spiritual life in this sermon be only a small supplement to the ministry at your local church. Blessings in Christ, the elders of North Point Baptist Church, Nairobi. Let me invite your attention now to the book of Mark, chapter 2. Uh, we will be reading from verse 23 all the way to Mark chapter 3 verse 6. So Mark chapter 2 from verse 23 all the way to chapter 3 verse 6. For those of you who are joining us uh, for the first time, we are working our way through the book of Mark. Took a break for the last three weeks and now come back to, to the book in our previous sermon. Uh, in the book of Mark, we considered uh, the proposition that the old way, the old norms and uh, way of being of the of the Jews must give way to the new way of Christ. We saw a conflict in the previous passage where there was a a clash of of worldviews and and cultures, uh, and today we uh, continue. In chapter 2 verse 23. So let me ask those of us who are able to. To stand for the reading of God's word. Mark chapter 2 verse 23. All the way to 3 verse 6. I am reading from the English standard version. One Sabbath. He was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way. His disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him. Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. And also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness, at their hardness of heart, and said to them, to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately had counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. And this is the word of the Lord. You may have your seats. The title of our sermon this morning is saved from dangerous religion. Saved from dangerous religion. In the year 1510, a Roman Catholic monk stood at the bottom of a set of stairs at a church in Rome. He had been taught that these stairs, which had 28 steps in total, were the stairs Jesus had ascended to appear before Pontius Pilate during his trial. The tradition of the Roman Catholic Church 
held that these stairs had somehow been removed from Jerusalem and brought to Rome. Even more, it was claimed that those who climbed the stairs on their knees would have their sins forgiven. And so this monk decided to go above and beyond the call of duty. Not only did he climb each step on his knees, he also kissed each step. And he repeated the Lord's Prayer 28 times. One for each step. When he got to the top, one historian wrote that he he looked back on that ordeal and he thought, who knows if this is true? Seven years later, that monk would post a document with 95 statements on the door of his church in Wittenberg in Germany. He posted these 95 statements for purposes of inviting discussion and debate on doctrinal errors of his church, the Roman Catholic Church. This act, however, would launch the Protestant Reformation. The monk's name was Martin Luther. He had been captive to the dangerous distortions of the Roman church. Many times he had tortured himself with fastings. Uh, He had frozen himself in winter. He many times flogged himself with whips, all because he had been taught that this was the way to be right with God. After years of terrible suffering, he discovered what the true gospel is. He was rescued and, and he said that It felt like he entered paradise through open gates. Our passage this morning will will show us Jesus confronting a false religion, much like what held Martin Luther captive. Here in ancient Israel had arisen a way of being among the Jews that was a far cry from what God had ordained for them. The people had been turned into slaves. They had been shackled by a distorted religious system which had dehumanized them in many ways. As we will see, Jesus will enter into direct conflict and confrontation with this system in order to rescue and restore people from it. So here therefore is a summary of our main idea this morning. Jesus powerfully restores what false religion dangerously distorts. Jesus powerfully restores what dangerous, what false religion dangerously distorts. So our outline uh, will break that statement into, into two portions. One, we will see the dangerous distortion. The dangerous distortion. And two, we will see the powerful restoration. The powerful restoration. So first, let us consider the dangerous distortion. These two stories that we have read are united by the fact of a conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees. These Pharisees, as we saw last time, are a strict Jewish religious sect. Uh, They form part of the Jewish ruling council. They are very powerful. Some of the harshest criticisms that Jesus aims at any group in Israel would be aimed at the Pharisees. Jesus would accuse them of gross hypocrisy and pride. He would call them whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones. They looked clean on the outside, but they were profoundly polluted on the inside. Already in our two stories, we can, we can see the tension building. In both stories, the Pharisees are watching and accusing or watching in order to accuse. So look at chapter 2 verse 24 and hear their first accusation aimed at the disciples of Jesus. 2 24. 
Why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Even though this accusation is about something the disciples are doing, it is really aimed at Jesus. What kind of outfit are you leading here? What are you teaching these disciples? They are breaking the law. And then look at chapter 3 verse 2 and see the the posture of these Pharisees to Jesus. Chapter 3 verse 2 says, And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. They are looking to make an accusation. They are looking for a specific crime, a religious crime to accuse Jesus of. At the end of the story, uh, they don't succeed in making an accusation, but they do go out and plot destruction against Jesus. So look at how the story concludes. Chapter 3 verse 6. The Pharisees went out and immediately, with a sense of urgency, immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Here we are introduced to a new group that we haven't really met in our journey through Mark. This group is called the Herodians. They were not a religious group like the Pharisees were. The Herodians were actually a political group. They were a political party. They were supporters of King Herod and King Herod's dynasty. Uh, Their hope was to see that dynasty spread throughout all Israel and be established as the former rulership over Israel. King Herod's dynasty had been put over Israel by the Romans. It was a, a kind of a, of an arrangement where the Romans rule that region through the dynasty of Herod. So the Herodians were the people who were pro-Herod. The Pharisees, on the other hand, would have wanted, one, Jewish independence from Rome, and then two, the dynasty of David to be the one that would be established in Israel. And so the the Pharisees and the Herodians had nothing to agree on. They were not on the same page. They were naturally enemies. Their their views were antagonistic to one another. Only in this one fact did they find common ground. Destroying Jesus of Nazareth. These two groups will appear later in the book of Mark in yet another joint quest to get rid of Jesus. So we ask, why are the Pharisees so dead set on accusing and destroying Jesus in our passage? Well, it all has to do with the Sabbath. Both our stories happen on the Sabbath, and all the conflict revolves around The Sabbath, these two stories are not chronological. One doesn't happen immediately after the other. They happened at two different uh, times, but Mark puts them together because there is this idea, this point he is trying to make. The Sabbath, meaning seventh, was the day of rest that God had commanded the nation of Israel to observe. Uh, This was patterned after God's six days of creation. And then on the seventh day, God rested from his work. The people of Israel were to follow that model. They were to work six days and then rest on the seventh. For the Israelites, breaking the Sabbath was punishable by death. You see, it meant that they were disregarding God's covenant with them as a nation. In fact, the Sabbath was the sign of the old covenant. The Mosaic Covenant. The Pharisees in our passage will accuse Jesus and Jesus' disciples of breaking the Sabbath. So look at chapter 2 verse 23 for the, the context of the accusation. One Sabbath, he, Jesus, was going through the grain fields... And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees see Sabbath breaking in the action of the disciples of plucking 
these heads of grey. Now, Matthew and Luke, when they record these stories, give us a bit more detail. Uh, they tell us that the disciples did more than just pluck the heads of grain. Uh, Matthew tells us that the disciples were very hungry. And Luke tells us that they rubbed the grain on their hands together. Uh, it is likely that the grain being spoken of here is barley. And they were rubbing the, the, the seeds to remove them from the stalk so that they could eat them. In verse 24, the, the, the Pharisees come out with this accusation. Why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? So according to the Pharisees, this act of plucking grain, rubbing it in their hands and eating it was an act of harvesting. It was an act of threshing. And perhaps it was also an act of preparing food to eat. This, in the scheme of the Pharisees, was work. And work was forbidden on the Sabbath. Now, God never actually forbade what these disciples were doing. God never demanded complete immobility and inactivity on the Sabbath. However, the Pharisees were enforcing extra rules that had been devised, which were designed to safeguard the Sabbath from being broken. According to them, the Sabbath needed to be kept pure, and the people just couldn't be trusted to do it. New laws were thought up and put on the people. And one such law, it seems, would forbid people from doing anything that looked like harvesting or preparing food. These extra laws became a great burden on the people. The the Sabbath would become a day of fear, became a day of paralysis, because one didn't want to act unlawfully and come under the wrath and the accusation of the Pharisees. The Pharisees had distorted God's gift to his people. They had set up a false religion that was concerned with outward conformity to a long list of man-made rules. They had laid a yoke on the people which the people could not bear. In the case of these disciples, the Pharisees' expectation was for them to stay hungry until the following day or until evening. They should not do anything to alleviate their hunger if it meant breaking one of their rules. Beloved, this is what false religion does. It distorts the gifts of God and turns them into burdens. It misrepresents God's goodness and makes him out to be a cosmic killjoy. It puts weights on people which they cannot bear. It will break people's backs in order to justify itself. It will enforce its man-made orthodoxy with fear. It will dehumanize people in the name of keeping them in line. It will accuse others of moral and theological crimes where there are none. It will even destroy people's lives who threaten to expose it. Are you a perpetrator of false religion? Do you put people under a standard that is higher than God's standard? Do people live in fear around you? Because they just might break one of your many rules. You see, there's a Pharisee in every one of us. The distortion by these Pharisees does not end with plucking some grain in a field. It goes further than that. It is more dangerous. This is why Mark gives us the second story. So let's look at chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand, and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. Here we see the true depths of this distortion. We see it because Jesus exposes it for us. 
How bad is the distortion? How dangerous is this distortion of religion by the Pharisees? Well, for these Pharisees, if, if someone is sick, they should not seek help on the Sabbath. And also, if someone can help heal a sick person, they should not do it on the Sabbath. Why? Because in seeking help, the sick person would be making someone work to help them. If the doctor has to examine them or to prepare a portion or medicine for them, they would be working. And so healing on the Sabbath was also strictly forbidden. It doesn't matter how serious the situation is, one must wait until the Sabbath is over. You will remember in an earlier sermon in chapter 1, how the people waited until sundown before they brought their sick to Jesus. Why did they do that? Because they were not allowed to seek help for the sick during the Sabbath. They were under the thumb of this false religion and they were suffering for it. In verse 3, Jesus makes this issue front and center. He calls a man with an obvious deformity to come forward where they could all see. We are told that there is a man here who has a withered hand. And then Jesus says to him, come here. He draws attention to this man. He puts him front and center because Jesus wants to enter into a conflict with this false, distorted religion. The Pharisees, we are told, are watching. What are they watching for? They are watching to see if Jesus will heal him on the Sabbath. Why? So that they can accuse him. They want him to do it. But not because of mercy for the man. The man is a prop for them. They want Jesus to heal him so that they can accuse Jesus of a crime punishable by death. Sabbath breaking. And then Jesus blows everything apart with his question in chapter 3 verse 4. Look at his question, chapter 3 verse 4. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or harm? To save life or to kill? His question is obviously directed at these Pharisees. But there's a crowd of people who have been under the thumb of these Pharisees who are watching and desiring to see what will be the outcome of this confrontation. That was the crux of the issue. There were really only two options. To do good or harm. To save life or to kill. Jesus means that not helping a person in need was equivalent in some sense to harming them. Not saving them was equivalent in some sense to killing them. So he asks the question, if it is on the Sabbath, what is the lawful thing to do? To do good or to do harm? You know, in another passage, Jesus reminded these Pharisees that they gave their donkeys water to drink and food to eat on the Sabbath. They would not allow their donkeys to suffer thirst and suffer hunger on the Sabbath. But they extended no such mercy to human beings. Now one would think that the answer to Jesus' question would be obvious. Of course, God wants his people to do good and to save life Every day, if a situation of need and mercy arises on the Sabbath, his people are to help. That's not how this goes. Note the response of the Pharisees, chapter 3, the last part of verse 4. But they were silent. But they were silent. They say nothing. Is it because they are confused and didn't understand the question? Are they silent because that is what wise people do? They keep quiet. 
they ponder. We actually don't need to guess why they are silent. Mark tells us in the very next verse. So look at chapter 3 verse 5. And he, namely Jesus, looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. Jesus is angry at them. Jesus is grieved by them. He is grieved because of their hard hearts, which were on full display. They could not admit they were wrong. They were too proud for that. They could not abandon their, their false religion. It was too important to them. It was their identity. They couldn't regard the sick man before them with mercy. He could wait. What mattered was that their man-made rules be obeyed and followed. Their religion, their system must be upheld. Their position of power within it must be safeguarded. In the face of such clear correction, they remain adamant. Their hearts are rigid and inflexible. They will not repent. They will insist on being right even when they have been clearly shown to be wrong. Here is a human heart for you. The Bible is so clear on what we are. The Bible diagnoses our condition so well and so clearly. This is what we are. This is the human heart. The human heart is hard towards God. It is a stone. It is a block of concrete. This is what God overcame when he saved us. Left to ourselves, we don't look at clear evidence and respond with humility. Rather, we double down on our error. We sink in our heels. We don't follow the truth. We suppress it. All so that we don't have to admit we are wrong. And you cannot turn and be saved if you will not admit you are wrong. Is that you this morning? My non-Christian friend, God has shown you plainly and clearly that you are wrong. He has shown you that the whole basis upon which you have built your life is wrong. The whole identity you have erected for yourself is built on a wrong foundation. You have built your life on a distortion of the truth. But you who prides yourself on being clear-headed, on being a seeker of the truth, are refusing to turn. You're refusing to open your mouth and openly acknowledge that Jesus is the truth. You are right now suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. You are hardening your heart. We plead with you. We beg you to come out of that path. We plead with you. We beg you to humble yourself. Plead with God to overcome your hard heart to overcome resistance and stubbornness of will. Die to yourself. Die to your pride. There is life on the other side of that humility. This Jesus confronts you, not so that he can shame you. He does so to save you. He died so that sinners do not have to remain in their stubbornness. He died so that we can give up our pride and serve him. So turn and trust in him. Perhaps you're here and you're a Christian and Jesus is confronting some element of your beliefs. Perhaps there are doctrines you have built your confidence upon which have been shown to be wrong. Don't harden your heart. Humble yourself. Embrace the truth. So, there is the dangerous distortion of the false religion of these Pharisees. It is a dehumanizing, exhausting distortion. It is a harmful, soul-killing distortion. It is a heart-hardening distortion, a murderous and destructive distortion. These Pharisees had turned people into slaves of a system. How terrible this was for all the people. One wonders how many sick people died on the Sabbath because they were afraid to get help. They were afraid of being accused of law-breaking. 
And so they withered away and died on the Sabbath. Reminds me of the distortions of the word of faith and prosperity gospel system of belief that tells people you are healed and as a sign of your faith, stop taking your cancer medication. And they are dead within a year. Or the distortions of Roman Catholicism that this monk Martin Luther we considered at the beginning that put people under an oppressive system that lacked all assurance. They obscured the gospel. They demanded conformity to unbiblical traditions of the church. They they removed all assurance of being made right with God and they, they launched people into a life of pursuing merit for salvation, including idol worship, praying to the dead, or our own personal distortions that we hoist on other saints. They must look and act and speak a certain way. Or we will accuse them of law-breaking. If they don't believe the same things as me on the COVID vaccine, if they don't believe the same things as me on the root of government, if they don't believe the same things as me on, on alcohol, if they don't believe the same things as me on the Israel-Palestine conflict, or a whole host of other debatable conscience issues. We call them anathema. They can't be in my life. They can't be in our church. They must conform to my self-made religion, to my rules that I have hoisted on them. May God deliver us from all dangerous distortions. What hope have we? Well, our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is always in Jesus. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Nothing more, nothing less. Which brings us happily along to our second point, the powerful restoration. The powerful restoration. So, how does Jesus deal with these Pharisees? How does he respond to their machinations to accuse and destroy him? In our passage, he does two things, which might surprise you. He points the Pharisees to the, to the truth of the Bible, and then he acts out the truth of the Bible. That's, that's what he does. He points them to the truth of the Bible, and then he acts it out. So let's go back to the first story and see what Jesus says. So the accusation has been made. They are breaking the Sabbath. This is what Jesus says, 225. Have you never read what David did? When he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. Don't you just love it when Jesus does Bible study? He will do this again in Luke 24 with those two disciples. Beginning with Moses and with the prophets, he showed them that the The son of man has to suffer before he enters his glory. Jesus does Bible study. Never underestimate the power of just pointing people to passages in the Bible. Just showing them, here is what it says. Here is what it says in context. Don't underestimate the power of just that. That's what Jesus is doing. Have you never read? It's a bit of an indictment of these Pharisees. Because these guys had memorized large chunks of scripture. But when your heart is hard... You miss the point. Here Jesus takes them back to a passage in 1 Samuel chapter 21. And what's going on there is that David is on the run from King Saul. David is a fugitive. He has a bunch of guys with him that they are running away from from Saul. They come to a place called Nob. The, The tabernacle that Moses had built is there. The Ark of the Covenant is there. They get there and they are desperate and they are hungry. Jesus says in the passage that he was in need. David was in need and hungry. And in their hunger they and desperation, they ask the priests. Uh, the particular priest who was there was a guy called Ahimelech. And Abiathar is his son. They ask him, is there any food here? Is there anything for us to eat? 
And the priest says there's nothing else except the bread of the presence. The bread of the presence was a, a bread that was kept before the ark of God, uh, signifying God's provision for his people uh, of bread. And this bread was to be eaten only by the priest. That was the rule that God had established in Leviticus. The high priest does something unimaginable. He says, there's only that bread. I'm going to bring it out and give it to you, David, and your men. Jesus highlights the fact that they were in need and they were hungry. The priest gives David and his men bread from before the ark. He is actually breaking the law because this bread was only meant for the priest. But David and his men eat it and God doesn't destroy them. Later in the story of David, a man would reach out and touch the ark and he would be instantly killed by God. That doesn't happen to David and his men. Jesus refers to this story to make some important points. First, he and his disciples are like David and his followers. Just like they were hungry then, so Jesus and his disciples are hungry now. Second, just like David and his disciples ate unlawful bread, according to the law of God, so the disciples of Jesus had plucked and eaten unlawfully, according to the laws of these Pharisees. However, notice that there is one difference. David and his men ate holy bread that was actually unlawful for them to eat because God had actually commanded that that bread be only for the priests. God had not commanded the Israelites that they couldn't do what these disciples had done. That was an extra law that had been added by the Pharisees. So what's Jesus' point? He's pointing out that in the case of David and his men, God showed that there were exceptional situations where a ceremonial law could be set aside to serve a higher value. Should David, the Lord's anointed, and his men go on suffering hunger when there was bread available for them to eat? Mercy for the hungry triumphed over the dictates of that ceremonial law. And so David and his men were nourished for their journey. Well, Jesus' point is this. If that principle applies in that situation, then it applies even more to this situation. These disciples, in their need and in their hunger, could pluck and eat the grain against the man-made rules of the Pharisees. If God set aside his own law for the good of David and his men, yeah, we can set aside your laws, you Pharisees for the good of my disciples. So, biblically speaking, exegetically speaking, these disciples are in the clear. Do you just love it when Jesus rises to your defense? But Jesus goes beyond that. Not only are they clear biblically, a passage of scripture, he says they are clear theologically. So Jesus does exegesis, and then he does theology. So notice what he says next, verse 27 and 28 of chapter 2. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So, Jesus here comes to the crux of the issue. The conflict was about the Sabbath. Here he now makes a theological point on the purpose of the Sabbath. It was made for man, not vice versa. Here Jesus has gone back to which book of the Bible? Genesis. He's gone all the way back to Genesis and he says, God made man on the sixth day and he made the Sabbath the following day. The Sabbath then was made to serve man. It was made for man to enjoy and delight in. Man was not made to serve the Sabbath. He was not made to become a slave to a paralyzing Sabbath system. He was not made to live in fear on the Sabbath of breaking a mountain of dehumanizing Sabbath rules. The Sabbath was a gift to be enjoyed, a good to be delighted in, a rest and not yet another labor. The Pharisees had managed to flip the Sabbath principle on its head and make men slaves of the Sabbath. Jesus comes to restore it to its proper place and purpose. 
And that is not all. Jesus makes one final astounding statement in verse 28. The Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. Now this is yet another claim by Jesus to divinity. You see, only God can properly be said to be the Lord of the Sabbath because God is the one who made the Sabbath. The Pharisees were claiming a kind of lordship over the Sabbath by seeking to determine what could and couldn't be done on it. Jesus corrects that by pointing to himself as the Lord of the Sabbath. What the Pharisees are doing is way above their pay grade. Jesus is the owner, the master of this day called the Sabbath. He made it. He's the one who determines what the Sabbath is. He's the one who determines what the Sabbath is for. Therefore, if he had allowed his disciples to pluck and eat grain on the Sabbath, then that's fine. Because he is the Lord of the Sabbath. And they are with the Lord of the Sabbath. And whatever the Lord of the Sabbath allows on the Sabbath is right. So far, Jesus has claimed authority to forgive sins, which caused some problems in the previous chapter. Here he is claiming authority over a day. Authority over the Sabbath. Yet another point in the book of Mark where he is saying, this man is not just a man, he is God. It's his day. And no one can tell him what he can and cannot do with it or in it. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. So notice how Jesus restores. He restores by pressing biblical truth into the situation. He restores by showing what the Bible teaches and laying down sound theology. Jesus doesn't want us to conform outwardly to his law. Just conform just because. Jesus actually wants us to understand. He wants us to know our Bibles and to know our theology well. So please don't be one of those people who look down on doctrine. Don't be one of those people who don't like theological discussion. Don't be those people who think you can have health and life in a church without sound doctrine. Brothers and sisters, ignorance of what the Bible teaches is where dangerous distortions come from. Members of Northwind Baptist Church, do not accept any teaching from your elders that is not necessarily rising out of God's word. For those of you who know what it is to be deceived by distortions, I was deceived for 11 years. You know how you were asked to just conform to the words of a charismatic leader. They claim to have a, a secret inner knowledge that only they had. And you could only get it from them. And when you saw contradictions, you were told to, to shut up. You were told to respect the anointing. Mafuta. <laughs> you remember where that led? Let us follow Jesus. And let him restore and build up our faith with his word. Jesus not only restores by teaching the truth, he restores by acting out the truth. He models what it means to know God's word and to live it out. And so look again at the second story, chapter 3, verse 5. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. He not only thought that it was right to do good on the Sabbath, he went ahead and did it. Be careful about being the kind of person who knows theology and knows the truth, but doesn't act it out. Be careful of being trapped in a world of philosophy and living in your head, living in the realm of scholarship and being utterly impractical. Jesus teaches the truth and he acts on it. This miracle of the healing of this man with the withered hand is itself a parable of the straightening and restoring work of Jesus. 
Here is a deformed, distorted hand. Much like the deformed and distorted religion of these Pharisees. Jesus straightened, straightens this out. And in his life and death, in his mission on earth, Jesus would straighten out and restore men. He would rescue them from deception and bring them into the light of the truth. This is why he came into the world, to destroy the works of Satan. And here is one of the triumphs of Jesus' death on the cross. Rescuing men from distorted and dangerous deception and religion. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2 and we will read a bit of a lengthy portion. Colossians 2 from verse 11 to verse 23. I just want you to see the, the connection between the death of Jesus and the demolition and destruction of this self-made religion and deception. Colossians 2, 11 to 23. I'm reading the ESV. In him also right, let me give you some time. I'm hearing pages turning. Colossians 2, 11 23. In him also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism in which also you were in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead and you who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demand. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in it. Therefore, this is an outworking of this powerful gospel. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon. Or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you. Insisting on asceticism. And worship of angels. Going on in detail about visions. Puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. And not holding fast to the head. From whom the whole body nourished and knit together. Through its joints and ligaments. Grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world why as if you are still alive in the world do you submit to regulations do not handle do not taste do not touch referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence on the flesh. The point is that Jesus died to free us from the distortions and the dangerous deceptions of self-made religion. Therefore, do not allow yourself any longer to be put under that yoke of bondage. Dear saint, are you sleeping into self-made religion? Are you becoming a legalist? Are you becoming a petty tyrant over other people's faith? Have you started to exhaust others with rules upon rules? Ah, There is hope for you to write here in Jesus. Stay close to Jesus. Be like Jesus. Put to death the Pharisee's spirit in your heart. Are you here and you are the victim of some deception by some man-made religious system. There is hope for you in Jesus. He can set you straight. He can rebuild your mangled faith. Just like he healed the man with the withered hand in our passage, he can heal you too. So come to him and follow him patiently. Sit at his feet. He will give you the, the freedom, joy, and rest of the true Sabbath. Because He is the one who powerfully restores what false religion dangerously distorts. 
Amen. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would help us to be like Christ. That you would help us to live out of the newness that he has accomplished for us in his death. That you would help us to follow closely in his example. Would you deliver us from all deceptions and distortions? And would you grant us to live in the rest that he has provided for us, to walk in the liberty and the newness of life that is ours in and through him. We pray these things in his name. Amen.